copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 84, regarding a train robbery at Noble. The Contra Costa County Sheriff's Office requests all cars to watch for a suspect described as thin, height 5 feet 10 inches, age 43, has sparse hair, and wears glasses. That's all. Time, look out. Here goes one. Oh, too bad. That one was a dud. Light another one, Brody. There, that firecracker exploded into thin air. Not a trace of it left. Just like Rio Grande cracked gasoline explodes in your motor. All power, no waste. But cut price, uncracked gasoline is like the dud firecracker. Because it only partly explodes. The wasted, unburned gasoline runs down your cylinder wall, ruining your oil seal, diluting your crankcase oil, so it's often useless in only 200 miles. You certainly don't save money using cut-price gasoline when a large part of every gallon goes to waste. Your motor needs complete explosion. That's why every automobile engine thrives on Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Each drop burns completely. There are no unburned leftovers to ruin your oil. Rio Grande puts gasoline through the newest, costliest, and most advanced refining process known to the petroleum industry, just to ensure that every drop will burn completely, so no power will be wasted. That's why your car speeds up on Rio Grande cracked, because you get full force, full power explosion instead of the half-hearted explosions of uncracked gasoline. That's why the cars that must have the finest gasoline, police cars, fire engines, ambulances, specify Rio Grande cracked more than any other brand. That goes for you, too. It costs you less per mile to drive with Rio Grande cracked gasoline. We are pleased to announce that the part of Inspector Austin in tonight's broadcast will be played by Wallace Ford, motion picture star now appearing in the RKO production, The Informer, and the Columbia offering, The Whole Town Talking. And now it is our great pleasure to present Sheriff John Miller of Contra Costa County, who will speak to you from the studios of KFRC in San Francisco. Good evening. Only the most desperate and hardened criminals would dare to hold up a mail train because they know that not only will the sheriff's forces and local police be hot on their trail, but also the federal G-men who will never give up until the robbers are punished. When our office received the flash that the mails had been robbed, our men devoted their entire energies to tracing the bandits. All clues unearthed by our men were turned over to the G-man assigned by the postal authority. And our deputies worked with him until the entire gang was accounted for. G-men can't work alone. They need the manpower and the knowledge of local police and sheriff's forces. We are not interested in glory. We want only to see lawbreakers captured. And my deputies are instructed to work just as hard on police and federal cases 
as on our own problems. In the true story that follows, you will see how many different law enforcement agencies were needed to bring all members of the robber gang to justice. On with the show. Morning of November 7th, 1930. Southern Pacific's train number 36, bound for Stockton and Sacramento, has just left Berkeley. And engineer R. E. Lemery and fireman F. E. O'Brien are setting down to an uneventful run. Same okay? Sure. Take it easy. Yeah, thanks. Are we on time? Right on the tick. Ever seen me when I wasn't on time? Oh, come to think of it, I haven't. Got to be on time today. We're carrying the payroll to the steel mills at Pittsburgh. Yeah? Sure. If we don't get in on time, those guys won't get the pay envelopes. Well, we can't let that happen. No, I'll say we can't. All right, you guys. Put them in this train now. Uh, what uh, is... Who are you? Stick up. Get your hand away from that brake lever. Keep it rolling. I'll tell you when to stop. What's the big idea? I just you know what you're carrying on this train. Uh, passengers, that's all. Yeah? Well, I know different. How far are we from Noble? That little flag stop? Yeah, that's it. Well, about a quarter of a mile. All yeah, right, slow her down. Now listen, there's a cord stretched between two stakes along the side of the track. You see it? Yes. Okay, stop this thing so that the cab is opposite the end stake. Now, what's the idea? Don't argue. Put on your brakes. Easy now. We're passing the cord. Now, pull her up. Okay, you guys, get down. Hey, what's the idea of that cord business? That measures the distance from the engine to the mail car. You see why? The boys are setting up the machine gun on that flat car right opposite the mail car. You guys sure had this plan, didn't you? Sure we did. Now get over there to that station. Okay, Frank, I got the engine crew. Hello, boy. Here comes the conductor. You take care of him. Don't worry, I will. Hey, lovely. Oh, can't you see it? Shut up, you. All right, conductor, up your hand. Whiskey, Betty. Okay. Yeah. Nothing on him. Tommy, all right, boys. All set. Hey, look here. You'd better not go through with this. Why not? This is dangerous business. Well, we're prepared for it. Your old train's covered with my men. We're not taking any chances. Now you're going to help me open that mail car. Oh, no, I'm not. Oh, yes, you are. Hey, listen, I'll shut up and wait around in front of me here. Let me along. You'll make a nice yeah. bulletproof vest. Now we'll wake up that mail clerk. Fire a slug into the door of that car, Eddie. Okay. <laughs> Drop that gun, mister. I will not. If you don't, I'll let you have it. Hey, don't shoot, Mac. You can't hit him without killing me. I'll drop that gun. There, that's better. Okay, now open up the car. Open it up. Listen, mister, we don't want to bump anybody off. But if you don't get into line, we'll have to. We've got a dozen sticks of dynamite here, and we'll blow up the car and you in it unless you open up. You better open up, Mac. We ain't got a chance. Yes, you're right, Steve. All right, Eddie. Take this conductor over to the station with the other two. Okay. I'm going to get the stuff. Here you are. Stuff them into one sack. Okay. Now, where's that bank stuff? What bank stuff? You know what bank stuff, that payroll shipment. Uh, I haven't any payroll shipment. Listen, do you think we'd go into this without knowing what we're doing? You're carrying the payroll to the steel mills in Pittsburgh. Now, where is it? I don't know anything about it. No? No. Then I'll find it myself. Hiding this stuff on me, huh? Well, it's one of your lousy train up for a trip like this. You can pull a fast one on me, do you? If I gave you what's coming to you, I'd bump you off with that little trick. But I'll give you one more chance. Get down to the other end of the car. Oh, please don't do anything to me. I, I was only doing my duty. Shut up and get down there. I'll stand there for five minutes with your face to the wall. If you stick your head out of this door, my chopper will blow it off. All right, Eddie, I got everything. Give the boys the signal. Okay, boys, Sam. Help me get this back into the car. Okay. Don't you want to tie up these guys? Ah, let them go. By the time they get to the next station, we'll be out of the heat. You get everything, Frank? Everything. Good. Come on, set that tomcat in there. Get in, Eddie. Everybody here? Yeah, all accounted for. All right, let's go then. It 
is ten minutes before the flustered train crew gets number 36 to Sed, where the alarm is sounded. And by the time the train reaches Stockton, postal inspectors Austin and Chan have arrived there by plane and quickly question the hold-up victim. Engineer Lemery has the most important bit of information. Now, oh, Mr. Lemery, what do these men look like? Well, it's hard to say. They, they all wore overalls and masks over their faces. They say they made their escape by automobile? Yes. I don't suppose you were able to get the license number of the car. Yes, I did notice it. You did? What was it? Seven W six five four nine. Yeah, that's right. The seven W six five four nine. Seven W six five four nine. Call the motor vehicle bureau of Sacramento right away, Austin, and see who that license is registered to. And a half hour later, in the little town of Orland, an officer is questioning the postmistress. Why? Why? Yes. That's my license number. Where is your car? Oh, I wish I knew. It was stolen last night. Stolen? Where? I I was visiting in Oakland. I left it in a garage at Harrison and 14th Street. And about midnight... The investigation reverses to Oakland police, who quickly visit the garage man at Harrison and 14th. You were on duty last night? Yes, sir. You know anything about a car being stolen out I, there? Yes. I, I was alone about midnight when two men came in. One of them pulled a gun on me, and the other one started the Buick and drove it out here by the office. And the guy with the gun jumped on the running board, and they drove off. What did these men look like? Well, I couldn't tell. They wore overalls and masks. In possession of all the available immediate clues, postal inspectors hold counsel of war with the chief of the Oakland Police Department. Well, chief, that stolen car clue didn't help much, did it? No. These men were certainly careful. Their overalls and masks. Well, here's all we know. They used a stolen car which they abandoned at Euclid Avenue and Virginia Street. And they left the empty mail sack at the electric depot. Now, where do we go from here? There's one thing you gentlemen have forgotten. What's that? Motor supple index. How do you mean? Oh, sometimes as important as a clue. I've been checking back on previous robberies, such as the McAvoy train robbery last year, Fresno winery robbery in 1928. They were both pulled with the same systematic procedure. Several men were involved. Machine guns and sawed off shotguns were used. Everything clicked off with rehearsed perfection. But these crimes run cold. Uh, not completely. We've been working on them. We have reason to believe that they involve an ex-con by the name of Frank Smith. Mm. The time for a bank robbery in Santa Clara back in 1909. Okay, bring Smith in. Let's question him. Yeah, first we have to locate him. Hello? Yes, this is Jim. Just got a report that I think you should know about. Uh, what is it? in the room. It was registered to an E.I. Sherwood. He checked out in a hurry this morning. Uh, get down there right away. Yes, sir. Uh, 185 half dollars left in the dresser drawer at the Los Feliz Hotel. That might be part of the stuff. Let's see. Uh, they got $50,000 in bills and 3700 in silver. $500 of that was in half dollars. Yeah, I'll leave it to a crook to make a stupid mistake like that. Of course, it might not have anything to do with our case. Yeah, we'll know pretty soon. Garrett's gone down to question the hotel employees. Now, Mr. Johnson, you say the man who occupied the room where the money was found registered as E.R. Sherwood? That's right. What else do you know about him? Nothing much. He was here for two days this time. You mean he stopped here before? Oh, yes, several times. You know anyone he associated with? Why, yes. He's quite friendly with the Mr. and Mrs. Ellis. Uh, Frank... P. Ellis, I believe their name is. They drive a blue coupe, as I remember. Frank P. Ellis. Drive a blue coupe? Yes. You know where Mr. Ellis lives? No, I don't. What else do you know about this man? Well, that's about all. Oh, yes. One of the bellboys ran an errand for him just as he left. Uh, let me talk to him. Uh, just a minute. Rob? Yes, sir. Uh, Harry, you ran an errand for Mr. Sherwood, didn't you? Yes, sir. Uh, will you tell this gentleman about it? Well, Mr. Sherwood asked me to express a package for him. A package? What kind of a package? Well, it was small and sort of heavy. Small and sort of heavy. Oh, it sounds like more silver, Mr. Johnson. Yes, it does. Where was the package going? To Seattle. What address? Well, let me see. I got it here somewhere in a piece of paper. Yeah, here it is. R.W. Carlton, Olive Tower Apartment, Seattle. Well, that's fine. 
We'll put the police on this right away. Seattle police investigate Mr. Carlton of the Olive Tower apartment, only to find that he had checked out that morning just after Sherwood arrived. Meanwhile, Oakland police work on the Ellis angle of the case. Chief, this may be a long shot, but I've got a hunch that this man Ellis who visited Sherwood at the hotel is the same fellow who pulled that post office hold up in Tracy two years ago. Yes? Why? Well, here's the silly part of my hunch. Both men drove a blue coupe. I'd like to backtrack on that investigation with Inspector Austin here and see where it leads us. Uh-huh, it's okay with me. You remember the investigation of that Tracy holdup, Austin? Yes. The license number on the getaway car was traced to a woman who had moved to Connecticut. She was completely innocent. Was it a stolen car? Apparently not. It always did... Father, I always did think that they had repainted license plates from the previous year. You remember the license on the car? No, but I've got it over at the office. Well, let's work backwards on that angle, then. <laughs> A check with the Motor Vehicle Bureau reveals that the license number on the getaway car used in the Tracy holdup in 1928 is the same as the license issued to Ellis in 1926, at which time he gave a San Francisco address. Officers tracing him at that address mean the information that he has a brother-in-law living in Berkeley. Although this gentleman proves his innocence and denies knowledge of Ellis's whereabouts, officers find the wanted man's address in a notebook. Once in possession of this information, a posse is hastily assembled, and on a quiet Sunday afternoon, nine officers representing the Oakland police, the federal government, and the sheriff's office close in on a pleasant little bungalow on an Oakland side street. And all posted, Garrett? It's around in the house. Good. All set, James? Yes. When I get in the door, set it open, you follow me in. Stay out of sight until then, okay? Okay. Here it goes. I beg your pardon, ma'am. Could you tell me where the Stewarts live? Why, I don't know. I'm not very well... Up. Hey, get your foot out of that door. I'm coming in. Frank, Frank! Quiet. One key better view and I'll lay you off. Come on, Jan. Hey, listen, you can't do this. You ain't got no right to... We're federal officers. Now, shut up. Grab that gun on the table, Jan. Hey, listen, you need a big slash. Look, this is my house. You can't break in here without a warrant. You don't need one now. You got a license for this gun? Why, I, I don't know. All I... right, that's a charge for the present. Now, keep quiet and don't cause us any trouble. The place is surrounded. Inspector Garrett just come in the back way, and it isn't going to do you any good to make a squat. Where's your husband? I don't know. There's no one in the bathroom here. Keep your eyes on the chance. Come on, Garrett. Yeah, he must be watching his face. Probably never heard it. Open the door. Hands up, Ellis. What? Hey, what is this, a hijack? No, it's an arrest. Uh, 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 drop that razor. Drop what I said. <laughs> now, get out of here and get into a shirt. You're going to headquarters. What for? Plenty. Suspicion of robbing the United States mails to begin with. Oh, but look here, you got the wrong guy. I'm a respectable salesman. I don't know what this is all about. Well, if you're on the up and up, it won't take you long to clear yourself, and I'll get going. Hey, Austin, this joint's an arsenal. What do you mean? The boys just found three rifles, a couple of automatics, and a flock of bulletproof vests. Yeah? So you're a respectable salesman, eh, Ellis? What are you selling? Munitions? Come on, get going. <laughs> For three hours, the officers remained with their prisoners in the bungalow, hoping for the arrival of other members of the gang. During this time, neither husband nor wife answered the constant interrogations of the officers. And Ellis complains of illness, confesses to being a narcotic addict, begs the officers for a shot, is refused. Finally, the prisoners are placed in separate police cars and convoyed to the postal authorities' headquarters. On the way down, Ellis apparently becomes much worse. Please, boys, please give me a shot. I can't stand this agony. No. Oh, listen, guys, be human, would you? In the first place, if I I haven't got any, in the second place, if I did, I wouldn't give you any. I tell you, I can't stand this much longer. Every nerve in my body's screaming. That's tough. Listen, these cuffs are cutting my wrist to beat the devil. At least take them off, will you? We'll be at headquarters in a few minutes. I'll take the cuffs off, Austin. It'll be all right. The poor guy's really suffering. Well, okay. Oh, thanks, Inspector. Thanks a lot. Gosh, those things cut bad. Ah, 
Well, here we are. Come on, Ellis, pile up. I don't know whether I can make it. I, I'm pretty weak. Here, I'll give you a hand. Easy. See, you don't know how bad I hurt. You guys would only give me a shot. You'll be all right. One more step now. There. Thanks, Blackfoot. Hey, come back here. I'm double crossing dirty. Hold, hold, or I'll fire. Go ahead and shoot. You can't hit me. Good shot, Austin. That dropped him. Come on, let's make sure he may be standing. All right, never mind now. Never mind, folks. Now stand back. Stand back, I say. Never mind. He said all right. I drilled him right through the heart. Mrs. Ellis had already been taken into the post office when her husband was shot. Withholding the news of his death from her, officers questioned her regarding the train robbery. For four hours, she submits unyieldingly to the barrage of questions fired at her. Finally, in an effort to break her, Inspector Austin plays his trump card. Mrs. Ellis, there's no sense in you holding out any longer. It's quite clear that you're trying to protect your husband. That's what you're trying to do, isn't it? What? Protect your husband. Protect who? Your husband. I don't know what you're talking about. All right, Mrs. Ellis. <laughs> but just for the sake of argument, we'll assume that you are trying to protect him. Assume anything you like, you dirty baboon. Well, he doesn't need your protection any longer because he's dead. What? Oh, I see. A trap, huh? No, that's a fact. He was shot trying to escape from us when we pulled up outside the building. He died immediately. Oh, yeah? Say, you can't catch me that way. You must think I'm a babe in arms. What I'm telling you is the truth. A copper never tells the truth. <laughs> Very well, Mrs. Ellis. I'll prove it to you. Come along. Where are you going to take me? To the morgue. Is that shooting case yet? Yeah, it's number 37. I want to get an identification. Mm, but I keep with. Here we are, here we are. Hold on the sheet, will you please, Doc? <gasps> well, Mrs. Ellis. I don't know that man. <laughs> Back in the post office, the questioning continues. Well, Mrs. Ellis, what have you to say now? Nothing. I've shown you the proof of your husband's death. That man's not my husband. Who else robbed the Southern Pacific train at Noble? I don't know what you're talking about. Isn't it true that your husband robbed the post office at Tracy two years ago? You drove the getaway car in the train robbery at McAvoy last year. And that's Fresno winery hijacking. You and your husband pulled that, too. Would you mind if I help myself to some water? No, there's a cooler in the corner. Thank you. Grab her, Gareth. She's trying to jump out the window. Come on. Ah, uh, Mrs. Ellis, what's the idea of that? I'd rather bump myself off than dirty myself being in the same room with you, swine. Very well. We'll place you in a nice private cell where you can think this whole thing over for yourself. And where there are bars to keep you from jumping out of windows. Lock her up, Gareth. With Frank Smith, alias Frank Ellis, dead, and Mrs. Ellis defiantly mute in jail, authorities begin the search for friends of the Smith, whom neighbors inform them are known as Mr. and Mrs. York. Shown a mug book, they quickly identify York as Charles Berta, a Canadian ex-convict. Meanwhile in Seattle... Postal Inspector Imus picked up Sherwood on the street from the description provided by Oakland officers. And then a few days later, in a small grocery store in Seattle... Now, what does that all amount to? Well, let me see. It's a dollar and 35 cents. And, uh, oh, yeah, let me have a dozen eggs. A dozen eggs, that's right. That makes a dollar and 60 cents. A dollar and 60. Let's see. That's 32 nickels, isn't it? Yeah. 32 nickels? <laughs> well, my Mr. Trotter, what you been doing? You're breaking the jackpot and slot machines? No, uh... <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, I've been saving nickels for a long time. Uh, oh, uh, several years now. Yeah, they do mount up, don't they? They certainly do. 
Stay on. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Carton. Good day. Good day. Yeah. Save the nickels for several years. Yeah, these nickels are all bright. They ain't never been used. They ain't the Goshen. They're all 1928 buffaloes. I think I'd better call the police. Thus, another mistake on the part of the criminals ensnares two more when Carlton and his wife are taken into custody. Mugged and printed, Carlton turns out to be Earl J. Christman, wanted in Detroit on a bunco charge. Back to Oakland swings the investigation, where finally officers locate the residence of Bertha and his wife. They lose no time in visiting the apartment of the suspect. Better try knocking, Stone. Uh, try it again, louder. All right, all right. Don't break the door down. Well, why don't you answer your bell, then? Do I have to tell that, too? What's the big idea? Who are you? Police officers. And you're Mrs. Berta. Wrong party. My name's York. Okay, Mrs. York. Alias Mrs. Berta. Where's your husband? I haven't any. Okay, have it your way. Mind if we come in? Of course I do. Well, we're coming just the same. You can't come in here without a search warrant. Here it is. Oh. Thought of everything, didn't you? Yep. Turn on the light, Stone. Go through the joint while I talk to Mrs. Burda. What do you expect to find, dead bodies? You never can tell. Come on, Eddie. Okay. Now, Mrs. Burda. I wish you'd use my right name. Suppose I just call you you. Okay, if you don't add anything to it. Okay, you. What do you know about that train robbery at Noble? Huh? That's easy. Nothing. Isn't it true that your husband is an ex-convict? I haven't any husband. What other silly questions can you think of? It might interest you to know that your husband's mug has been identified as one of the mob that held up the SP train at Noble. <laughs> Considering the fact that I have no husband, it does. Go on. This is the best laugh I've had in a month. Maybe that's your non-existent husband now. I'll answer it. Don't bother. I'll answer it. Hello? Oh. Well, I'm sorry. You've got the wrong number. <laughs> Gee, the telephone service is simply awful in this town. Yeah. Huh. Can you beat that? Another one I got. Hello? Hey, what's wrong up there? You've got the wrong number. Hey, soon. Go on with me. I heard a guy's voice on the other end. Eddie, you stay here and watch Mrs. Burton. What do you mean you heard a guy's voice? A guy said, hey, what's wrong up there? My hunch is that it's Burda. He saw all the lights on and got suspicious. I bet he's down at the corner drugstore telephoning. There's a guy who answers his description, standing across the street in front of the drugstore. Yeah, he's seen us. He's walking away. Come on, let's try to catch up with him. Yeah, he's wise. He's running. Let's go. Get out your gun. Right. Hey, you, stop. Oh, tackling stone. Hey, what's the big idea? Quiet, you. Help, police. Something is wrong. Yeah. What's going on here? It's all right, Sergeant. We're officers. Give us a hand. Oh. Very well, Inspector. Come on, you. Quiet down. Yeah, I got a little surprise for you guys. Is that so? Now well, there's one for you. Take that gun off in stone. Call the ambulance, Sergeant. Uh, yes, sir. I guess that'll teach you to pull a rod on a policeman. It was three months before Berger recovered from his bullet wound, and during this time, postal inspectors and Oakland officers amassed a tremendous pile of evidence and array of witnesses. In July of 1931, Mrs. Smith and Sherwood went on trial, were found guilty and sentenced to 25 years apiece. When he had recovered from his wounds, Berta also received a 25-year sentence. Christman, who had been returned to Michigan and sentenced on the bunco charge, had been brought back to testify on the trial, and on his return to the Michigan penitentiary, escaped from the officers in El Paso and is still a fugitive. The fourth member of the gang, James Sargent, was captured two years later and sentenced to his 25 years. And authorities are still looking for bandit number five, whose identity the trial never brought out. Modern police activities are so efficient that very few lawbreakers escape paying the penalty for their crimes. Rio Grande cracked gasoline is proud of the prominent part it plays in the capture of thousands of criminals. Today, police cars make greater speed and have greater power than ever before. Because Rio Grande's exclusive cracking process creates a gasoline that gets the maximum power from modern motors. Police officials of leading western cities prefer Rio Grande Crack. Specify it more than any other brand. Why don't you try the same gasoline your police use and get police car performance in your own car? 
Every month, 375,000 people go into Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline Service Station and ask for a free copy of the Calling All Cars News. Get your copy of this interesting publication. Read the true stories of crime to be dramatized on this month's Calling All Cars broadcast. Broadcast 84 regarding a train robbery. Suspects this case are now in custody. That's all.